Welcome uh, to La Trobe University in Melbourne. Um, we're delighted to have Andrew Hughes-Hallett, uh, professor at uh, George Mason University as well as uh, St Andrews in Scotland. Um, let me welcome uh, my students as well uh, from various classes as well as some of my colleagues. Uh, we're here today to talk about um, the European Union, um, focusing primarily on the future and on the economic side, but I'm sure we'll uh, also talk a little bit about the politics and, and the past. Um, so, Andrew, I mean, it's, it's very hard to even know where to start with Europe, but um, what would you, can you give us a brief summary of what's happening now and, and, and the key issues that you can see uh, that need to be resolved? Well, right now, obviously, the dominant issue is to do with sovereign debt, debt by the governments. Um, and that's been dominating the news, I suppose, for, for a couple of years now, starting with Greece, but of course, as always, when problems happen is in the euro area, and I stress this is the euro area, not the EU as a whole. Um, if problems start with one country, and it's like dominoes, when, when, that, when that one gets into difficulties and something happens, uh, then the markets will start worrying about the next country. What's, what's the linkage there? How, how are the countries connected so... Well, in this case, it's very simple. I mean, it started with Greece, who's got a sovereign debt problem of the old-fashioned sort. That means to say the government spent too much money, didn't raise enough money, and accumulated too much debt, which it now can't service. It can't pay the interest payments, and it can't uh, refinance the debt when it comes due. So they need help. And it links in the other countries uh, significantly uh, in the sense that the money that they uh, raised to, to, to um, create this debt came from banks typically in other euro area countries. It appears that actually things have changed slightly in the last year. It used to be the German banks were the most exposed, but now it's the French banks. I think the German banks have been trying to get rid of some of this uh, exposure to the Greek debt. In fact, there's, there's a recent news that I think Moody uh, changed the outlook of the three leading French, French banks, banks because uh, of this. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I looked at it in the newspapers this morning to check out, so I had the numbers right. Um, and it's about uh, $55 billion worth of debt um, being held by the French banks and about $35 billion worth of debt being held by the German banks and then various others. So I immediately there's a linkage because if there were a default, if Greece were unable to... Uh, continue financing the debt or being helped to finance the debt, then of course the collapse would be caused in the French banks principally and followed by the German banks because their debt holdings would be worthless, which means they haven't got enough uh, assets to, uh, to, to match the loans they've made, so they have to then pull in the loans in those economies. So an immediate ripple effect from, from Greece to uh, France and Germany, which is why the French and German politicians are working so very hard to try and um, finance the debt and, and keep it rolling over and into the future. <coughs> and can these efforts and be successful or at all? <laughs> it's beginning to look like not. As one of the unresolved issues in, uh, in the economic analysis of this, uh, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, is whether in those circumstances it's better to default early. It's least costly. Whatever you do is going to be costly. So it's least costly to default early rather than try and avoid the default and then stagger on and have difficulties in refinancing, which will mean that each time you need to refinance, the interest rates that you have to pay go up, it becomes more expensive, and of course that's coming out of the current budget, so that just makes life worse. But of course there are potential costs to defaulting early. Uh, the traditional view is you'll be shut out of the capital markets. That means to say when you come back, as, a, as in this case the Greek government, uh, let's say a couple of years later, needing to borrow money for, um, to keep the economy going in the, in the ensuing recession. Uh, that they would be told no, full stop. I'm not sure that that's the case, but that's a received wisdom, and the well, German, German finance I mean, minister is saying the same this morning, which is not very helpful. Well, uh, there have been examples of countries that haven't really... Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Argentina did uh, Absolutely. okay after the... Uh, what, what, uh, what the empirical analysis shows when you get down to it is that after a default, typically, not always, but typically, um, when you go back to the markets, you are actually allowed to borrow. And what's driving that is not what happened in the past, but it's the outlook into the future. If you want to borrow into, uh, again, um, after a default, if you want to borrow then, if you can show the markets you've got good prospects of growing, in other words, their money is safe and they'll get the rate of return that they expect on it, then they will lend the money. So, in fact, in empirical terms, on average, countries which default tend to grow 
pretty fast, pretty quick afterwards, and don't have any problems getting back to the markets. Argentina is a case in point. I wouldn't like to go into Argentine politics. We thought Greek politics was bad. Argentine politics are worse, with due respect. Um, the, but uh, what happened when in 2001, when they did default, it was a, a major default. There were riots all over the place. 25 people were killed in the ensuing mayhem. The exchange rate, which had been one to one with the US dollar, dropped to four to one. A lot of people lost their savings, hence the riots and so on. But then, let's say, I don't know exactly, but maybe a year later, the economy begins to grow again. Why? Because the exchange rate's fallen, exports are cheap. What does Argentina do? It exports lots of grain and lots of beef and some oil and things like that. It appears to be cheap. And so the economy begins to grow. And I think I'm right in saying it's uh, been growing at sort of an average of 6 to 8 percent since then, along yeah. with plenty of inflation, we have to add as well. But, uh. yeah, but you identified a very important kind of uh, mechanism, offsetting mechanism that might help um, uh, affected countries. It's the exchange rate. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Greece doesn't have the luxury. Well, here, of, uh, here, it, here it gets of, more complicated, and, it, and, and when it gets more complicated, of course, it gets more interesting. Uh, as you say, Greece doesn't have an exchange rate because it doesn't have its own currency. It has the euro, so it's tied. If I think of it as an exchange rate of one-to-one -one with everybody else in the Eurozone, if you like, and it can't break that. So that makes it much more difficult. And in principle, the only thing you can do in those circumstances seriously is uh, what I was talking about yesterday, is, is the internal devaluation. That's to say you arrange that your prices relative to everybody else's prices go down. So it's just a, a, a real exchange rate devaluation through the relative price ratio. Um, but of course, it's not quite so easy to do that. First of all, you can't do it overnight. And secondly, the principal uh, element in the price level in the economy, of course, is wages and wage costs. And so uh, what you're really doing is you're asking the population to take a, a pay cut. Uh, it may be a literal pay cut, or it may be a, uh, a pay cut in the sense that um, the non-wage costs, those are the costs which employers have to pay over and above the wages when they employ you. And I can't tell you what the numbers in Greece are, in Italy, roughly speaking, but I do know what the numbers are. If, it, if uh, your wages were 100 euros a day, it costs the employer 150 euros a day to employ you. That extra 50 is in pension contributions, social security contributions, and things like that. So you can cut on that as well. But that, of course, is, a, is cutting uh, income in kind, if you like. It's future income, because if it's on the pension contributions. <clears throat> and Greece, I think, is having great trouble doing that. I am not entirely sure uh, whether they've actually done anything in that direction. Other countries in this context, meaning Ireland, for example, have done it when they got into trouble um, a little after Greece. The instant reaction of the government was to impose a, a 5% pay cut across the entire economy, everybody. In, in Ireland? In Ireland, in nominal terms, just like that. And uh, there have been various other... Um, uh, there may have been further pay cuts after that. There's certainly been uh, reductions in um, the pension entitlements and so on, which is, means that then the employers have to pay less into the fund to provide whatever pension is now promised, and so the, the costs come down there. So yep. you can do that, and that's that's a, that's a, you know the option which is available if you stay in the euro. Now you you have a lot of insights from various countries because you've consulted uh, for just about any institution I can think of currently the the European Central Bank and, mm -hmm. and various governments and, and European Commission. Now, so what's what's the big difference between Ireland where these reforms were um, received? Uh, uh, relatively well, and, and Greece, where people go to the streets and, 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 and try to uh, the politics, kill the government. The politics is quite different. I have to say, though, um, before we get into all of that, that the, the, there are four countries in trouble at the moment that we know, uh, talk about, and very unhelpfully called the pigs. That's Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and, and Spain. And the first three are all um, in a rescue package uh, through the European Commission and the European Central Bank and the IMF. The fourth Spain hasn't got there yet, but people are very worried about it. And uh, of course, it could go further than that. Um, and in all four cases, the, the, uh, they have de sovereign debt problems, but they're quite different in each case, which means th the response of the government may be quite different. Greece, as I said, is an old-fashioned one. The government spent too much money for reasons which are probably entirely to do with uh, um, political maneuvering <laughs> and special interests and so on, not to do with the... Uh, the economy. Uh, Ireland is uh, started off with a property crash, rather like the subprime in the US, um, but uh, the banking system was deeply involved in that and the government had borrowed money from the banks and all the rest of it. So uh, the real problem there is actually the government deciding that uh, the government itself was not in big trouble. Uh, 
it had probably, at the beginning of this process, 2007, it had as low a deficit and debt ratio as anybody in Europe, probably about 35% for the debt ratio, whereas Greece is now 150, so I mean, there's a huge difference there. So the, the government itself, uh, fundamentally, was not in trouble as such, but uh, the banking system was, and the government chose to bail the banking system out. Now, you might wonder why that is. Partly it's to do with the fact that, of course, the financial markets are involved in every part of the economy. So if you don't bail the banking system out, then you get all the firms going bust uh, and uh, unemployment rising and so on. So it's natural that you would want to do that, perhaps. Also, Irish politics is um, complicated, <laughs> that's to say. Every, every, and people who are in politics are also in the banks and, and, and they're all, they all play golf on Saturdays. You know, so uh, the connections are very close. And so the government made the um, decision to bail the financial system out, which in this case moved a... Uh, they must have had a, some, a small deficit at the beginning of this process, uh, let's say a couple of percent, to this year it's at 32 percent of GDP. So a huge thing, but ba basically they're just bailing the banking system out. Mm. So that one's like that. Portugal, I have not understood properly. It seems to be a private sector uh, problem in that the private sector, meaning both businesses and private individuals, have borrowed too much money through the banking system. Credit was too easy and all the rest of it. So basically the private sector accumulated too much, uh, too much debt and the government here is, doesn't want the entire private sector to go down the tubes so that they are underwriting their, not so much the banks as such, but businesses and, and private individuals. Um, and, and Spain is an old-fashioned subprime problem. If it happens, it hasn't happened yet. The markets are worried. It's not the big banks in Spain, but the, uh, in, in English English, anyway, not about Australian English, uh, the building societies, the, the mortgage banks and so on, had lent a lot of money to, uh, speculatively, to um, people wanting to buy houses or apartment, um, holiday apartments or something, or businesses building them. And with the... Um, financial crash in the world, the demand for that suddenly fell away. And uh, so two things happen. One is that those mortgage banks get into trouble and have to be supported by the government. And the second thing is the construction industry, which is a significant proportion of GDP collapses. Mm. So the, the, the lesson here is it's very difficult now to come in with a standard economic analysis and say, this is how you deal with a debt crisis. Each one of these is rather different. Now, just to document some numbers, uh, the IMF estimated that the net present value of the um, liabilities of the Irish government uh, for the financial institution bailouts is in the order of 200% uh, of GDP as opposed to for most other countries it's just uh, you know between 20 and 30% of GDP which is still still a lot but yeah. uh, you're quite right that the the, the sources of the problem are very different. Now, you, you touched on uh, uh, interesting issues. Um, um, we, we had Don Brash here um, um, a few weeks ago, the former governor of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and he, um, he talked about the too large to fail uh, problem and, and how he would uh, deal with it. And his mm. suggestion is, is, is very much like, okay, well, it is true that some of the largest institution, banking institutions in the country might be too large to fail, but we should explicitly acknowledge that these have the, the guarantees of the government. And, uh, and, and because of that, we should apply strict regulation in terms of you know, higher reserve requirements and so on. And everyone else should explicitly be acknowledged not to be covered by these guarantees because they're not too large to fail and they should just be, uh, be allowed to fail. What, what do you think about that? Well, no, I mean, it, it logically, it makes some sense uh, to do that. And uh, what you're really f getting at is two things. One is who has a guarantee explicitly as opposed to implicitly and who doesn't, that rem removes a lot of uncertainty. Because there are a lot of, uh, as things stand at the moment, there's a lot of assumptions that, that certain firms or banks have a guarantee, but it's not written down anywhere, and you don't actually know whether it would be honored in the, in the event. Um, so it, that helps remove some uncertainty. And um, that's not a, it's not an unusual view. I think the IMF would say exactly the same uh, in this. It's a question of what, uh, can you price the guarantee correctly? So uh, we're talking about, making some guarantees explicit and some other ones which have a very high price uh, which are not explicit. Mm. 